Section 12 of The Watergate Report, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 2. Chapter 4, Campaign Financing, Part 12. 6. National Hispanic Finance Committee. Benjamin Fernandez and John Priestess. One aspect of the Hispanic campaign effort was presented in public hearings on November 7th and 8th, 1973, through the testimony of John Priestess, a Miami, Florida builder, and Benjamin Fernandez, chairman of the National Hispanic Finance Committee, NHFC, an arm of the Finance Committee to re-elect the President. In February 1972, Fernandez formulated the idea of a Hispanic Finance Committee to solicit funds from Spanish-speaking citizens and presented it to Maurice Stans, who gave it his approval. With an original goal of $1 million, Fernandez managed to raise only about one-third of that total. Priestes' potential as a contributor came to Fernandez's attention in late February 1972 at a cocktail party in Florida. According to Fernandez, Carlos Nunez, a former associate of Priestes, told him, after he had been introduced as chairman of the National Hispanic Finance Committee, that a potential contributor was John Priestes. Priestes, although not Spanish-American, was well known in that community and had been active as a FHA contractor, building large numbers of federally insured low-cost housing in Dade County, Florida. At that time, Priestes was receiving considerable publicity in the Miami Herald, which was describing an intense investigation of Priestes into charges of FHA fraud and his imminent suspension by the FHA. Nunez provided the committee with an affidavit describing his conversation with Fernandez, which included his statement to Fernandez that, with all the problems at that time, I didn't know if he, Priestes, would be in a position to make any contribution. Fernandez decided to pursue the lead. He called Priestes and arranged to meet him the next day. As recounted by Priestes, he and Fernandez discussed his problems with the FHA, and Fernandez indicated that he knew of Priestes' problems and was in a position to help solve them. In return for his help, Fernandez wanted Priestes to contribute $100,000 to the NHFC by cash or cashier's check. After an initial payment of $25,000, Fernandez would introduce Priestes to Maurice Stans, the former Secretary of Commerce, who had just taken over as chairman of the FCRP. At that time, according to Priestes, he would be expected to contribute a second $25,000, and Stans would, in Priestes' presence, call HUD Secretary George Romney. The balance of $50,000 would be due when Priestes' FHA suspension was lifted. Priestes agreed to make the contribution by cashier's check. Fernandez advised Priestes to bring with him when he was to see Stans, the press clippings that Priestes had shown Fernandez, which outlined his FHJ problems. Fernandez's account differs significantly, although he confirms that Priestes was prepared to make a large contribution, that he listened to Priestes' story, and that he agreed to arrange for Priestes to tell his story to Stans. First, Fernandez testified that the figure of $100,000 was never mentioned in the conversation. Rather, he sought $50,000 and Priestes indicated that he would be willing to contribute $25,000. Second, cash was never mentioned. Third, there was no discussion of the problems Priestes was having until after the discussion of the contribution had been completed, and then Priestes was concerned principally with the bad publicity and not the HUD investigation of him. Fourth, according to Fernandez, Priestes maintained that he was innocent and interested only in a fair hearing, and Fernandez said that Priestes could address his concern for fair treatment to Stans. In addition, Fernandez testified that at no time did he have any contacts with the FHA on behalf of Priestes or anyone else. Priestes was supposed to deliver $25,000 to Fernandez on March 4th, but had not yet raised the money by that date. When he met briefly with Fernandez at a charity ball on the evening of March 4th and told him this, they agreed that Priestes would bring the money with him when he came to Washington to meet Stans. Priestes next met with Fernandez in the latter's hotel room, at the Hay Adams Hotel on the evening of March 12th, the day before the scheduled meeting with Stans, for the purpose of getting last-minute directions. Also present were Fernando Ochaca, treasurer of the NHFC, and Jose Manuel Casanova, Florida chairman of the NHFC. As described by Priestes, there was some consternation in the group, because of the very recent disclosures concerning the $200,000 contribution by ITT to the president's re-election effort. 
As recounted by Priestes, he objected to the fact that ITT, one of the country's largest corporations, was contributing $200,000 while he, a relatively small builder, was being asked for $100,000. It was agreed to reduce his anticipated contribution to a total of $50,000, $25,000 then and $25,000 when his suspension was lifted. Priestes presented the check he had brought with him, which he had obtained as a loan from a friend. It was made payable to the Republican National Committee, and Fernandez became upset, because in no event could it be used by the NHFC or FCRP. In his public testimony, Fernandez stated that there was no discussions in that room with respect to Mr. Priestes' donation. There were no discussions with him with respect to the IT&T matter, to which he, Priestes, testified yesterday. None whatsoever. The meeting with Maurice Stans took place the following morning, having been scheduled on March 8th by Fernandez and Hugh W. Sloan, Jr., who at the time was treasurer of the FCRP. Sloan described the circumstances of arranging the interview as follows. About early March 1972, Mr. Fernandez indicated that he wanted a big knockoff for the Hispanic Finance Committee, and said that he would start off with the potential contributors from Florida and mentioned that he hoped that he had a couple of contributors in the $100,000 class, including John Priestes, whom he wanted Stans to meet. Sloan advised Stans of Fernandez's request, and Stans agreed to the meeting. Priestes arrived at the meeting with the $25,000 check and his portfolio of press clippings. Priestes and Fernandez were ushered into Stans' office, where Priestes turned over the $25,000 check to Stans. Again, there was concern over the check, both because it was not made payable to FCRP or NHFC or some other arm of the campaign, but to the Republican National Committee, and because the check was for $25,000 and made Priestes subject to a gift tax. Priestes testified that there was a discussion of substituting either a number of $3,000 checks made payable to a re-election committee or cash for the $25,000 check. In addition, Priestes presented Stans with his press clippings that described his FHA problems. While Stans looked at them, Priestes described his problems with the FHA. According to Priestes' testimony, after he gave Stans the check and Stans made no effort to telephone HUD Secretary Romney on his behalf, Priestes said that he had been promised that Stans would call Romney. Priestes says he also asked, Do I have any reassurance here that I am going to get anything for my money? Stans told Priestes, I will make a call and see what we can do. If we cannot do anything for you, we will return the money. Fernandez denied that Priestes asked Stans to pick up the telephone and contact George Romney. Rather, Fernandez recalled, Stans quickly reviewed Priestes' clippings and probed as to the difficulties Priestes was having in Florida, which Priestes described as minor technical difficulties. Stans then indicated that he was not knowledgeable about Priestes' problems and indicated that he wanted to take a look into his personal background, adding that, If we find that you are indeed in difficulties of a serious nature, we want nothing to do with you, and we want you to know this. Fernandez quotes Stans as saying, Ben, do not deposit this man's check until you hear from me. Fernandez testified that at no time was there discussion about Stans making a telephone call to anybody. Stans's unsworn statement to the committee makes no mention of any request by Priestes to telephone Secretary Romney, and focuses on two concerns of Priestes, first, that he was an unfair victim of the Miami Herald, and second, that he was afraid that HUD or FHA would take action against him on the basis of that publicity, and that he wanted to be treated fairly. Stan's statement reads, 7. I flipped through the file of newspaper clippings in his presence and promised to read them later. I also told him that I could not evaluate the situation without knowing FHA's attitude toward him and his transactions that I would have to check with HUD. I returned the check to either Fernandez or Priestes to hold until I had been able to do so. At the conclusion of the meeting, Stans expressed his evaluation of the meeting to Sloan, who described it to the committee in the following language. After the meeting, Mr. Stans was upset and expressed his displeasure with the meeting to me, stating that the contribution was not in the $100,000 class, as he had been led to believe, and further that he was concerned about Mr. Priestes personally. Mr. Stans told me that we would have to have better clearance of potential contributors who wanted to meet him. Following the meeting, Stans checked with both HUD and the White House concerning Priesties. Stans was advised by both the sources to have nothing further to do with Priesties, since he was unreliable and undesirable. As related by Fernandez, Stans told him, 
much as i hate to return this money to this man we had better return it because he is in trouble up to his ears and it will make us all look bad if we accept his donation meanwhile priestes upon returning to miami learned that as he had anticipated his suspension had been announced on march thirteenth nineteen seventy two as testified to by priestes he made repeated calls to fernandez in california to ascertain what efforts were being made on his problem and fernandez stated that he was working on it fernandez in his testimony said that he could not recall whether he had telephone conversations with priestes after the march thirteenth meeting a few weeks later as recounted by priestes a representative of fernandez whom fernandez said he was unable to name returned the twenty five thousand dollar check to priestes and indicated that perhaps something could be done for cash when priestes insisted that stans witness the transfer of the cash the representative balked and the matter was dropped thereafter priestes called fernandez and discussed the above contact with him fernandez said that he would make some telephone calls and get back to priestes in what priestes describes as a complete turnabout fernandez solicited five thousand dollars and said we never promised you anything when Priestes asked what about the benefit he would get from contributing. Priestes protested and became indignant, saying, What was I doing in Washington with a $25,000 check? I'm not even a Republican. But Fernandez reiterated what he had said. Fernandez testified that he could not recall soliciting Priestes for a $5,000 contribution, that it was improbable but possible that it occurred. Priestes frankly asserted that he was seeking a quid pro quo for his contribution. The issue was summed up in the following exchange. Mr. Dash. Mr. Priestes, when Mr. Fernandez first discussed what help he might be able to obtain for you, according to your testimony, for your contribution, did he put it on the basis that he could help you get a fair trial or fair hearing? Mr. Priestes, no, sir. I expected to receive a fair trial without paying for any money. I mean, it was not. There was nothing to do with a fair trial, a fair hearing. Mr. Dash that was not mentioned at all mr priestes no because i made it clear that was not what i wanted i said that i didn't want to make a contribution i was not interested senator irvin you were like one of my clients i had one time he asked me what i could do and i said i will try to get you justice he said that is the last thing in the world i want section seven committee questionnaires in attempting to gather evidence of illegal, improper, or unethical activities in connection with the 1972 presidential campaign, a written questionnaire was sent to a selection of about 700 individual contributors, corporate officers, and union executives in the fall of 1973. A. The Sample Canvassed The names of individual contributors were obtained from GAO lists of post-April 7th contributors, Inasmuch as extensive personal interviews were conducted with the largest individual contributors, as well as the largest contributors of cash, an effort was made to sample a different class of contributors. Taken from the GAO lists were names of individuals who were listed as having given $3,000 to either a Democratic or Republican presidential candidate. Whereas all the Republican contributors selected gave to President Nixon's campaign, the sample of Democratic contributors included contributions to a number of candidates, Approximately 110 Republican and about 50 Democratic contributors were sent questionnaires. If the spouse of the contributor gave $500 or more to a presidential candidate, he or she also was asked to provide the committee with a completed questionnaire. The $3,000 figure was selected in part because of the anticipation, a correct one as it turned out, that proposed legislation would place a maximum of $3,000 that could be contributed by an individual to any particular presidential candidate. A copy of the questionnaire sent to an individual is attached here too. The corporate questionnaire was sent to officers of a selection of corporations appearing on the Fortune 500 list, the same list used for a direct mailing under the Weed Scott Corporate Solicitation Program. The list included oil, insurance, textile, milk, business machine companies, trucking and automobile manufacturers, banking and accounting firms, utility companies, electronic companies, and defense contractors. Taken into account in the selection was the size of the company and geographical distribution of the companies in an effort to gain as much of a cross-section as possible. No effort was made to create a scientific sample. Once the names of the corporations were selected, questionnaires were sent to the chief executive officer, the chief fiscal officer, and the officer in charge of government relations. 
those persons known to have made a substantial contribution to a presidential candidate or who were under investigation were deleted from the list finally officers from one hundred and thirty six different corporations were selected and a copy of the attached corporate officer questionnaire was sent to each a third questionnaire was sent to the top officials in seventy unions selected for his canvas were national and international unions not locals with a membership of at least fifty thousand a copy of the questionnaire sent to the union officials is attached b results of questionnaire survey of the more than seven hundred questionnaires sent to individuals and corporate and union officials the committee received a response from officers of every corporation and officials from every one of the unions canvassed as well as from eighty per cent of the unaffiliated individuals to whom questionnaires were sent it appears that the corporate questionnaire may have been responsible for uncovering two corporate contributions and evidence of a third offense among the corporations selected were carnation and diamond international counsel for carnation delayed their response to the committee's questionnaire until after holding discussions with the special prosecutor's office and advising them of a corporate contribution in the case of diamond international officers of that corporation answered the questionnaire detailing the circumstances of the corporate contribution well before any public disclosure was made as discussed elsewhere in this report both diamond international and carnation have pleaded guilty to violations of section six ten of title eighteen a questionnaire sent to the corporate officers of rca disclosed a possible violation of section six ten in connection with the activities of the hertz corp a subsidiary of rca the results of the committee's investigation into this situation is also discussed in the section on corporate contributions of the 334 people responding in connection with the corporate survey, 164 individuals from 112 different corporations made a contribution of $100 or more to a presidential candidate in 1972. The survey demonstrates the disclosure law had an effect on contributions. Fewer people contributed larger amounts of money prior to the April 7, 1972 deadline than those contributing post-April 7. The answers to the questionnaire sent to corporate officers revealed that a total of $1,896,322 was contributed to presidential races by the chief executive officer, the chief fiscal officer, and the Washington representative of the queried corporations. The amount contributed prior to April 7th was nearly twice that contributed post-April 7th, $1,225,556 to six hundred and seventy thousand seven hundred and sixty six dollars of this total over seventy five per cent was contributed to the nixon re-election effort one million four hundred and forty three thousand eight hundred and thirty dollars this amount was almost evenly divided between pre-april seventh and post-april seventh seven hundred eighty six thousand eight hundred and eighty nine dollars prior to april seventh and six hundred and fifty six thousand nine hundred and forty one dollars after the april seventh date it should be noted that of the $452,492 contributed to Democratic candidates, all but $58,225 represents the contribution of a husband and wife to the campaign of former New York City Mayor John V. Lindsay. Thus, aside from this large dual contribution to the Lindsay campaign, the responding corporate executives as a group contributed more than 25 times as much to the President's re-election effort as they did to all the Democratic candidates combined. Contributions to the Nixon campaign were more than 100 times the contributions to the McGovern campaign. A breakdown of the contributions by the 164 corporate executive contributors is as follows. C. Contributions by corporate executives. Name, Nixon. Pre-April 7th, contributions, $786,889. Number of contributors, 61. Post-April 7th, Contributions, $656,941, number of contributors, 119. Number who gave pre and post April 7th, 29. Total amount of contributions, $1,443,830. Number of contributions, 151. Lindsay, pre April 7th, contributions, 394,267. Number of contributors, 2. Post-April 7th, contributions and number of contributors, 0. Number who gave pre and post-April 7th, 0. 
Total amount of contributions, $394,267. Number of contributions, two. McCloskey. Pre-April 7th. Contributions, $18,500. Number of contributors, two. Post-April 7th. Contributions, and number of contributors, zero. Number who gave pre and post April 7th, zero. Total amount of contributions, $18,500. Number of contributions, two. Mills. Pre April 7th, contributions, $5,750. Number of contributors, four. Post April 7th, contributions, $5,600. Number of contributors, three. Number who gave pre and post April 7th, zero. Total amount of contributions, 11,350. Number of contributions, seven. McGovern. Pre April 7th, contributions, $3,450. Number of contributors, two. Post April 7th, contributions, $6,975. Number of contributors, four. Number who gave pre and post April 7th, one. Total amount of contributions, $10,425. Number of contributions, five. Muskie. Pre April 7th, contributions, 8,750. Number of contributors, seven. Post April 7th, contributions and number of contributors, zero. Number who gave pre and post April 7th, zero. Total amount of contributions, 10425 Number of contributions, 5. Jackson. Pre-April 7th, contributions, $5,500. Number of contributors, 4. Post-April 7th, contributions and number of contributors, 0. Number who gave pre and post-April 7th, 0. Total amount of contributions, $5,500. Number of contributions, four. Humphrey, pre-April 7th, contributions, $2,200. Number of contributors, one. Post-April 7th, contributions, $1,250. Number of contributors, three. Number who gave pre and post-April 7th, zero. Total amount of contributions, $3,450. Number of contributions, four. Hartkey. Pre-April 7th contributions, $250. Number of contributors, one. Post-April 7th contributions and number of contributors, zero. Number who gave pre and post-April 7th, zero. Total amount of contributions, $250. Number of contributions, one. Total. Pre-April 7th contributions, $1,225,556. Number of contributors, 84. Post April 7th, contributions, $670,766. Number of contributors, 129. Number who gave pre and post April 7th, 30. Total amount of contributions, $1,896,322. Number of contributions, 183. As noted above, responses were received from 100% of the unions contacted by the committee. As in the case of corporations, the survey attempted to uncover any evidence of illegal contributions out of union funds, as well as contributions from the union's political action arms and from the union officers as individuals. No evidence of illegal union contribution activity was disclosed. Significantly, of the nearly 200 individuals responding to the questionnaire, only two, both officials of the Teamsters Union, contributed more than $500 of their personal funds to a presidential candidate. One gave $4,000 and the other gave $2,000. The results reflecting activity by the union's political action arms revealed a strong bias in favor of the Democratic candidates. Senator McGovern received a total of $678,782 from 19 separate unions. Senator Humphrey received $176,556 from 15 unions. Senator Hartke received $14,250 from six unions. Senator Muskie received $5,736 from two unions. President Nixon received $44,500 from six unions. It should be noted that these contributions represent donations from only national or the international union. 
it does not include contributions that may have been made through either the individual conferences district councils or the locals of a particular union there were two cases in which the political action arms of the unions made significant loans to presidential candidacies the communications workers loaned one hundred thousand dollars and the united auto workers loaned one hundred and fifty thousand dollars both to the presidential campaign of senator mcgovern in both cases only part of the loan was repaid and the large balance was subsequently treated as a donation to the mcgovern campaign in the case of the communication workers ten thousand dollars was repaid and ninety thousand dollars was donated and in the case of the auto workers eighty two thousand dollars was repaid and sixty eight thousand dollars was donated the results of the union questionnaire are as follows d union contributions to presidential candidates the table lays out the union and the candidates mcgovern humphrey Muskie, Hartke, and Nixon. AFL-CIO? None. Associated Actors and Artists of America? None. Allied Industrial Workers? None. Automobile, Aerospace, and Agricultural Implement Workers? UAW. McGovern, $128,000. Muskie, $500. Bakery and Confectionery Workers? None. Barbers, hairdressers, cosmetologists, and proprietors? None. Boilers makers, iron shipbuilders, blacksmiths, forgers, and helpers? None. California State Employee Association? None. Carpenters and joiners? Humphrey, $500. Chemical Workers Union? McGovern, $1,350. Civil Service Employees Association? None. Clothing Workers of America? McGovern, $50,746, Humphrey, $1,000, Hartke, $250. Commercial Workers of America, McGovern, $123,369, Humphrey, $7,566, Hartke, $500. Distributive Workers of America, McGovern, $8,147. International Union of Electrical, Radio, and Machine Workers, none. United Electrical, Radio, and Machine Workers of America, none. International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, McGovern, $5,522. National Federation of Federal Employees, none. International Association of Firefighters, none. Glass Bottle Blowers, none. American Federation of Government Employees, none hotel and restaurant employees and bartenders none bridge structural and ornamental iron workers none north america laborers nixon twenty five thousand dollars ladies garment workers mcgovern sixty six thousand seven hundred and ninety two dollars national association of letter carriers none graphic arts industrial union mcgovern sixteen thousand ninety dollars International Longshoremen's Association, none. Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's, none. Machine Printers and Engravers, none. Machinists and Aerospace Workers, McGovern, $24,600. Maintenance of Way Employees, none. National Maritime Union, none. Meat Cutters and Butcher Workmen, McGovern, $54,200. United Mine Workers, none. Molders and Allied Workers, none. American Federation of Musicians, Humphrey, $1,500. American Nurses Association, none. Office and Professional Employees, none. Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers, McGovern, $32,975. Humphrey, $2,225. Operating Engineers, Nixon, $2,000. Plasterers and cement masons, none. Plumbing and pipe fitting industry, none. Fraternal order of police, none. American Postal Workers Union, Nixon, $3,500. Printing pressmen and assistants, none. United Paper Workers International Union, Nixon, $3,000. Brotherhood of Railway Carmen, none. Painters and Allied Trades, Humphrey, $1,000. Railway, Airlines, and Steamship Clerks, Freight Handlers, Express, and Station Employees, McGovern, 
Humphrey, $2,500. Hartke, $10,000. Nixon, $5,000. Retail Wholesale and Department Stove Union, McGovern, $1,500. Service Employees International, Humphrey, $1,000. Sheet Metal Workers, none. State, County, and Municipal Employees, McGovern, $18,056. Humphrey, $600. Muskie, $5,236. Hartke, $250. American Federation of Teachers. McGovern, $30,536. Humphrey, $100. Teamsters. Nixon, $6,000. Alliance of Independent Telephone Unions. None. United Textile Workers of America. None. Textile Workers Union of America. McGovern, $100. Hartke, $250. Theatrical stage employees and moving picture operators, none. Amalgamated transit union, none. Transport workers union, McGovern, $15,575. Humphrey, $1,000. United Transportation Union, Humphrey, $4,800. Hartke, $3,000. International Typographical Union, none. International Union of Upholsterers, none. International Woodworkers of America, none. Rail Clerks International Association, McGovern, $74,802. Humphrey, $11,926. Rubber, Cork, Linoleum, and Plastic Workers, McGovern, $16,442. Humphrey, $8,140. United Steelworkers of America, Humphrey, $41,699. American Association of University Professors, none. Total, McGovern, $678,782. Humphrey, $176,556. Muskie, $5,736. Hartke, $14,250. Nixon, $44,500. End of section 12. Section 13 of the Watergate Report, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Dennison, Portland, Maine. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 2. Chapter 4, Campaign Financing, Part 13. Section 7. Corporate-Oriented Solicitation The Finance Committee to re-elect the President engaged in systematic solicitation of campaign contributions from corporate executives and middle management salaried employees. It engaged in this solicitation through principally two programs. First, what was varyingly called the Corporate Conduit Program, or the Corporate Group Solicitation Program, here and after referred to as CGSP, whose purpose was, according to the persons in charge of it, FCRP, Vice Chairman Newell P. Weed, Jr., and Harold B. Scott, to generate substantial funds by encouraging individual corporations to stimulate their employees to contribute. The rationale behind the idea was that individual companies could more effectively reach principal top management and middle management personnel than was possible by traditional fundraising programs. CGSP was first conceived in March 1972, but it was not until June that the structure of the program was set and it was put to operation. The program ultimately reached executives from 1,893 corporations and included two major mailings to corporate executives. The second major element was the industry-by-industry industry campaign headed by Buckley M. Byers, which concentrated on 60 major industries and involved some duplication of the Wheat-Scott effort. A third solicitation method approved, but not stressed by FCRP, involved organized employee good government committees. Part A. The Corporate Conduit Program Number 1. The Plan there were two important features to this program. 
First, the CGSP was aimed at companies and certain groups of people within companies who would most likely contribute to the Republican candidate for president, including top management and middle management levels. With this expectation in mind, it was decided to send a bipartisan appeal to this select group for funds and expect a large return in favor of the FCRP. Moreover, in some cases, the program was implemented in a firm on an outwardly bipartisan basis with the implicit understanding that the chief executive would work toward a result heavily weighted in favor of the president. Thus, the December Weed Scott report, apparently directed to Stans, stated, Our target was to develop a large number of smaller gifts rather than major gifts from a few donors. The law of numbers would make this program successful, as it does the implant solicitations now conducted by most corporations for United Fund and other charitable organizations. A typical corporate goal would be to solicit a group of 500 employees and receive an 80% response with an average gift of $100, which would provide a combined donation of $40,000. A continuing base of only 500 firms nationwide with this average result would produce a national total of $20 million, and this is a most practical goal if organized properly over the next few years. The second important aspect of the CSP was that it was so constructed as to circumvent the necessity of an individual company having to file disclosure forms as a political committee under the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971, FECA, by having the checks made out directly to the candidate, but mailed to FCRP together. Following this procedure, there would be no public record of contributions classified by the company of the donor while there would be such a record at FCRP. An informal opinion by the Department of Justice issued on September 15, 1972, although late in the campaign, gave credence to the FCRP viewpoint that CSP was legal. The opinion made two significant points regarding corporate investment in political campaigns. A. Bona fide bipartisan corporate solicitation programs, even where the corporation is a defense contractor, are legal under Sections 610 and 611 of Title 18, United States Code. B. Under a conduit system, whereby the employee is making his contribution directly to a candidate or committee of the candidate, even though utilizing a middleman, instead of to a corporate fund or officer, a corporation's participation is not such as to require it to register as a political committee. Part 2. The Execution of the Plan Originally begun with the Fortune 500, this list was expanded to 1,000 and ultimately 1,893 corporations, which included the Fortune 1,000 plus top insurance companies, financial institutions, and service companies. These companies constituted the Blue Ribbon List. Developed during the summer of 1972, the program generated a total of $2,791,134, according to Weed and Scott. In an interview by committee staff, Harold Scott provided to the committee a description of the operational mechanics of the Weed Scott program. The country was divided into two, then further divided into regions, each region having a director. The regional directors were usually prestigious businessmen from the area. An organizational meeting was called in the region with the administration figure as speaker. At the meeting attended by corporate business leaders from the region, Scott or Weed would explain the corporate group solicitation program, and after the explanation, they would then distribute a conduit system kit describing the program. Personal contact was relied upon heavily. It appears that problems developed because the internal conflict over the partisan versus bipartisan approach and the idea of maximizing recognition, since central to the approach was the emphasis on associating the contribution with the corporation of the contributors, and FCRP stressed the importance of contributors receiving recognition for their contributions. In a letter mailed to over 150,000 corporate officers, Maurice Stans stated, 
our committee's records of the combined contributions from you and your associates will maximize recognition of your group's support of the President. One of the selling points of the conduit system was that corporate executives could legally contribute in what in the aggregate constituted a large contribution, and the aggregate contribution from the company would not go unnoticed. As noted in an untitled memorandum prepared in December 1972 by Weed and Scott, which appears to have been intended for stands, the question of the concept partisan versus bipartisan was discussed. Related to the legal questions discussed below, this issue plagued the corporate conduit program from the beginning. The program was conceived by a partisan group and its design naturally included heavy overtones of partisanship. It soon became apparent, however, that chief executives who might themselves be solidly in the Republican ranks were often hesitant to make a partisan approach to employees. Many employers flatly refused to do anything which had any overtones of pressuring the employees in an area outside the firm's principal activities. In addition, the law, Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971, left some doubt as to the conditions under which a firm could legally engage in partisan and or bipartisan political activities, and also questions about the extent of activities allowed. As a result, the program was prompted on both partisan and bipartisan basis. In instances where a partisan approach was untenable, the bipartisan was trotted out. In some cases, the program was implemented in a firm on an outwardly bipartisan basis, with the implicit understanding that the chief executive would work toward a result heavily weighted in favor of the president. In other cases, the roster of employees approached was restricted to the management group and other white-collar workers in hopes well-founded, as it turned out, that this group would be largely predisposed in favor of the president. Apparently, typical of the objections raised by some businessmen was a letter dated July 14, 1972, to Stans from the president of a New Jersey company. After noting that he, quote, strongly supported the policies of President Nixon, unquote, the writer continued, I think this is a most unfortunate approach to the solicitation of contributions. I would strongly object to any pressure, no matter how subtle, imposed upon me by our corporate officers, as I would expect the people in my division to object to any pressures exerted by me. In addition, your reference to the use of committee records on organization contributions to maximize recognition of support appears to substantiate the democratic charge of recognition of special interest groups. This certainly highlights the opportunities of the oil interests, as an example, to make a substantial contribution in order to buy further administration support for unfair oil depletion allowances, which are eventually paid for by the taxpayer. Frankly, my feeling is that your approach is going to have a negative rather than a positive effect on the overall support of President Nixon and his forthcoming campaign. FCRP aide Robert L. Cratley responded, Former Secretary Stans has asked that I reply to your letter, which objects to the solicitation of contributions from employees of companies. The program being utilized by this committee is similar to programs used within many of the major corporations in this country. That is an employee-directed system of political fundraising. We believe that the chief executive of a company should have the option to conduct a fundraising campaign as he sees fit, but we do provide him with the option of making each gift totally anonymous and thereby affording complete protection to the employees. Despite this position, which stressed the availability of anonymous contributions, the post-campaign Weed Scott report advised the abolition of this procedure. In a section under Solicitation Materials, Problem Areas, and Recommendations, the report states, A key problem was the reference to our first set of materials on the How to Do It card that suggested the double envelope system used to return the contributions if privacy was desired. It became apparent that employees returning a contribution to their CEO or other senior officer would respond far better in terms of dollar amount of the gift 
if they did not use the anonymity of the sealed double envelope system. Comparative results by those corporations using the double envelope and those that did not make it extremely clear that the latter method should be used. Our how to do it card and our suggested procedures were changed in the latter part of the campaign to eliminate any reference to the double envelope system. It is not a requirement of the law that this anonymity or privacy be maintained, and as all gifts are a matter of public record anyhow, with the disclosure provisions of the new law, it is strongly recommended that in the future the conduit system include this change in emphasis. Part 3. CGSP Direct Mail Program The success of the CGSP Blue Ribbon Solicitation Program may be contrasted with the direct mail solicitation to businessmen. The direct mail solicitation letter was drafted by Maurice Stans and mailed on about July 4, 1972, to approximately 150,000 businessmen listed in Dun & Bradstreet. The letter was followed up by calls and another letter, according to FCRP, confirmed with the direct mail concern that sent out the solicitations. Only $14,000 was profited from the direct mail campaign, which cost $53,000. Approximately 200 companies constituted conduit programs as a result of the direct mail effort, and about $25,000 was received from these 20 companies. So at most, this first mailing raised $39,000. A second direct mail letter was sent in late August and early September to 35,000 firms listed in Dun & Bradstreet. This letter was a higher quality piece than the first, and as a result, a larger percentage of firms agreed to institute a conduit system than those in the first mailing. The cost of this mailing was $21,000, with only about 600 actual respondents. The direct mail results were not as expected. The response from the money-in-the-envelope response was negligible, about 1%, according to FCRP. In fact, the conclusions of FCRP about the direct mail effort reveal its limitations as a fundraising technique. The Weed Scott report concluded that the direct mail portion of the corporate conduit program's effort was not effective by any standards. In fact, FCRP concluded that, quote, no direct mail should be sent to major potential contributors, including all officers of the 2,000 largest corporations. While it was recognized that this would entail considerable effort, it was concluded that the cost is not excessive in terms of potential benefit. Thus, it was concluded that it was worth considerable time, effort, and money not to send mailings to these corporate officers. Part B. Industry by Industry Program the industry-by-industry industry solicitation program provided double coverage of most of the corporations covered by the Weed Scott program and the individual FCRP state chairman. However, this duplication was acknowledged as a means to ensure a good return from solicitation under the total corporate solicitation program. The logic of the program was summarized by Buckley M. Byers, director of the industry-by-industry industry effort, in an October 23, 1972 memorandum to Stans. In some 60 industries, we have had a leader in each industry who personally knows his counterparts, who are the chief executive officers in that industry. He also knows what the specific problems of the industry are, what President Nixon has done to help his industry, and also what the alternatives would be for the industry. In his memorandum to Stans on November 27, 1972, reviewing the performance of the industry efforts, buyers would usually begin with a statement on the effectiveness of the coordination of the industry. Comments such as that a coordinator did not perform to expectations or was a disappointment after considerable optimistic talk were balanced by evaluations that a coordinator did a first-class job some who seemingly put forth their best efforts apparently were simply the wrong person for the job. Buyers felt that the coordinator should be from an individual company and not from a related trade association. 
Although, on occasion, industry coordinators instructed their respective industry counterparts to send their contributions directly to FCRP, buyers wanted the individual coordinator to receive the donations first so that an accounting of the total industry's contribution would be readily available. This report described the home builders industry, which raised $334,059, as productive and well-organized. Twenty days after the election, Byers stated that this group, in my opinion, could still be pressured into giving some more if absolutely necessary. No further contact was made, according to the industry chairman, who told the committee staff that there never was any pressure exerted on him or the industry to contribute. The organization of the agribusiness industries suggests the comprehensiveness of the industry-by-industry industry program. Within this general industrial classification were dozens of different types of businesses and concerns, each with a sub-chairman. For instance, the Agribusiness Committee not only included soybean and beef production, but also farm implement dealers, florists, cottonseed crushers, and, according to the FCRP, industry-by-industry industry files, 35 other sub-classifications. The November 27, 1972 Byers Report attributes contributions of $209,457 to the agribusiness industry. Although the industry-by-industry industry program started relatively late in the campaign, the program appears to have generated at least $7 million in contributions, according to Byers' preliminary final report, which he conceded required updating. The largest industry contributors, according to Byers' November 27, 1972 report, were pharmaceutical, $885,000, petroleum products, $809,600, investment banking, $690,812, trucking, $674,504, textile, $600,000, carpet, $375,000, Automobile manufacturers, $353,900, home builders, $334,059, and insurance, $319,000. It appears from memorandums obtained from FCRP files that some corporate officers, especially those whose companies' business heavily rely on government contracts, balked at the idea of the industry being the contribution spotlight and not the company. Thus, a memorandum from Buckley Byers, dated July 17, 1972, re the aerospace industry, states, Vern told me in no uncertain terms that such an effort would not be successful in this industry, the reason being that they are so heavily dependent on government contracts that individuals in any one of the top seven companies would want a representative of any of the other companies to get credit for raising this kind of money. A July 26, 1972 Byers Memorandum raised the same problem in the case of the airline industry, pointing out that one industry figure noted that all of the airlines are exceptionally jealous of each other. Apparently, the industry-by-industry industry program sought to acquaint itself with the problems of the solicited industries. While the committee has developed no specific evidence that the FCRP industry-by-industry industry program influenced government action, it apparently reviewed industry problems and forwarded the industry's concern to the interested officials. Byers' November 27, 1972 memorandum summarizes his views. We have a good nucleus of people to work with now, and we must keep most of them actively involved. In this connection, I would recommend that many of our industry chairmen be asked to serve as appointed members of the Republican National Finance Committee. We are also going to have to do what we can to help our industry chairmen with the problems of their industry and see to it that they get proper attention from the administration. Only in this way will they become convinced that our relationship is not a one-way street. Another buyer's memorandum regarding non-ferrous metals noted that there would be absolutely no question about FCRP's choice accepting and doing an outstanding job if we could give some reasonable assurance that we would render whatever assistance possible to the industry. 
There is no evidence that any efforts were made on behalf of the industry by FCRP, though the industry was credited with $55,600 by buyers. Byers' view of the potential of the program was summarized in his October 23, 1972 memorandum to Stans. While there was an industry-by-industry industry effort in 1968, it was admittedly too little and too late. The effort this year could also have been far more successful had it been in effect much earlier. Now that we have a reasonably good organizational nucleus, I would urge that it be kept alive, strengthened, and enlarged. Such an effort could be invaluable in the senatorial and congressional races in 1974, as well as in any special election that might come up in the meantime. If it is continued, it could be, in my opinion, proved to be the answer in 1976. Part C. Separate Segregated Funds. Corporate Good Government Committees. The Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971 permitted a corporation to provide for the establishment, administration, and solicitation of contributions to a separate segregated fund, commonly named Good Government Committees, to be utilized for political purposes. The corporation need ensure only that the money was not obtained through force or threat of employment reprisals or in any commercial transaction. The provision in the 1971 Act for a Separate Fund basically codifies the decision of the Supreme Court in Pipefitters Local 562 v. United States, 407 U.S. 385, 1972. There, the Court sanctioned the common practice of separate funds for political purposes set up by labor unions and, by analogy, corporations governed by the older Corrupt Practices Act so long as the persons contributing to the fund were fully aware that their contributions were voluntary. It is in this area of voluntary funding that the 1971 Campaign Act may be unclear and possibly subject to abuse. The Act specifies that the use or threat of physical force, job discrimination, or financial reprisals will render a contribution involuntary, and the Supreme Court has said that under the previous legislation, Contributors had to be aware that their donations were strictly voluntary. One area of potential abuse is the situation where the employer, perhaps through another high-echelon corporate officer, asks his employees to participate in a good government committee by making donations. In this situation, it is more difficult to differentiate between coercion and implied pressure on the one hand and a legitimate appeal asking for involvement in a citizenship program on the other. Unions effectively utilized separate segregated political funds by raising substantial amounts of money from their membership, most of which went to Democratic candidates for president. However, corporate-related segregated political committees though not as commonly known to the public as a union, also provide a substantial percentage of contributions to campaigns. From reports filed with the Clerk of the House and the GAO, it appears that hundreds of thousands of dollars went to the committee to re-elect the president prior to the April 7 deadline in 1972. Post-April 7, according to GAO records, five corporate-related committees reported that $138,556 went to the Finance Committee to re-elect the President from the same committees. $20,650 went to Senator McGovern's campaign, and $650 went to one other Democratic candidate for President. Many corporations already had in existence corporate good government committees prior to the advent of the 1972 presidential campaign and readily utilized them for the campaign. Some of these corporations ended their good government committees just prior to April 7, 1972, because of the legal uncertainties arising from the questions of interpreting Sections 610 and 611 of Title 18 United States Code. And still, other companies instituted new segregated political committees following the guidelines of the new law. Concern existed not only over the legality of good government committees, but over appearances. Although making use of these committees was part of the 1972 presidential campaign effort by FCRP, 
they were aware of possible criticism. Thus, a February 28, 1972, memorandum from White House consultant Jack A. Gleason to David Wilson, assistant to John Dean, noted under the heading Public Relations that historically virtually all corporate political structures have been subjected to illogical criticism by the press for their activities. Further, their activities have not been especially useful or effective. Gleason's plan to make the committees more useful and effective appears in the memo's next paragraph. Whatever Section 610 permits, any major corporation making a major effort by itself will be subjected to additional press criticism. The only way I can see to offset this possibility is to establish a committee of prominent businessmen to see that their corporations and others that they approach jointly announce that these corporations, say a hypothetical minimum of 30 major corporations, have chosen to exercise their responsibility to good government by establishing a 610 committee as provided for under the new law. Such a leadership committee can be stacked with pro-Nixon men, but should also include a creep or two like J. Irwin Miller to avoid any blatant pro-Nixon appearance. Additionally, such a committee should be made up principally of five or six real clout businessmen who can pass as reasonably nonpartisan and must be prepared to devote a considerable amount of time to the project. The committee investigated a number of corporate good government committees and found two companies which had programs that warrant presentation, Gold Incorporated and Tennessee Eastman Company. 1. Gold Incorporated Gold Incorporated, a large government contractor which has a multi-year contract to manufacture torpedo parts, started Better Government Association, BGA, in 1969 as an outgrowth of the Gould Incorporation's philosophy of taking an active part in politics. The fund was divided into two types of employees, the salaried exempt and the salaried non-exempt. The salaried exempt employees were the 100 senior officers of the corporation. In 1972 and 1973, approximately 90 officers contributed to the fund, from the 5,000 salaried non-exempt employees solicited in the same time period, approximately 350 contributed to the fund. Employees were theoretically able to specify to the recipients of their individual contributions and make suggestions as to who should receive contributions from the discretionary fund, which was the money not allocated by individual contributors. BGA was administered by three officials of Gould Incorporated, William Il Visiker, President and Chairman of the Board of Gould, Elmore Wyatt, and Roger Morley, two other company officials. In February 1972, Il Visiker was approached at a breakfast in Chicago by Stans, a personal friend of his. Stans stated, according to Il Visiker, that we've got you down for $50,000. After the breakfast, Il Visiker met with Morley and Wyatt to discuss a contribution from BGA. All agreed that $50,000 was an unrealistic figure and decided that $20,000 was more within the ballpark. Since BGA had about $9,000 in the BGA account, it was decided that a personal loan to BGA would have to be made. Il Visiker decided to make the loan personally on two conditions. One, that BGA pay the interest on the loan, and two, that he would exert no immediate pressure to be repaid. Thus, on April 3, 1972, Il Visiker went to the National Security Bank of Chicago and secured a note for $20,000 and made the loan to BGA. Only the three above-mentioned officers of Gould Incorporated had knowledge of the loan to BGA and also knowledge of the subsequent contribution to CRP. No one else was told about the contribution until shortly before the election in 1972. Not one of the salaried non-exempt employees of Gould Incorporated knew about the contribution until the fact was reported in the newspapers in the fall of 1972. Over a year after the actual contribution was made to CRP, the loan was repaid. 
The funds to repay Il Fisiker came to BGA as a result of a massive solicitation effort within Gould Incorporated in the spring and summer of 1973, in which Gould employees were solicited for non-allocated contributions. 2. Tennessee Eastman Company The Tennessee Eastman Company, located in Kingsport, Tennessee, maintained a plan. Volunteers for Better Government, VBG, which involved centralized control under three trustees, two corporate officers, and a local lawyer. The payroll deduction authorization was for a deduction of 1% of the employee's gross salary. There was no option on the amount of deduction. The average contribution was about $300 per employee. The VBG organizers were empowered with the right to terminate the payroll deduction at any time they felt that they had enough funds on hand and then reinstate the deductions whenever they wanted more funds without taking the matter up with the individual contributor. There was no option on the part of the participant to designate the candidate of his choice. No reports were made to contributors, and employees were not advised of the identity of the recipients of VBG's contributions. No evidence of coercion was found, although one employee stated that he had participated because he wanted to be a team player. VBG stopped the payroll deductions as of November 1, 1972, and has not reinstated them as of this date. The reason given was that the committee had on hand funds amounting to approximately $28,000, and there was no campaign or candidate to support. The report filed with the Secretary of the Senate reveals that the receipts of VBG for the year 1972 was $30,442.37. The only donation to a presidential campaign in 1972 was $30,000, which was given to FCRP. Cash on hand as of December 1972 amounted to $28,161.89. End of section 13. Recording by John Dennison, Portland, Maine. Section 14 of the Watergate Report, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Dennison, Portland, Maine. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 2. Chapter 4, Campaign Financing, Part 14. Section 9, Compromise of Campaign Debts. Investigation by the Select Committee has developed evidence that at the same time as the presidential campaign committees of Democratic candidate Senator George McGovern were settling bills with creditors, including corporations, at 50% of their face value, these presidential committees were making substantial transfers of funds to McGovern senatorial committees in anticipation of a 1974 contest for his re-election to his Senate seat. The transfer of funds was first revealed by the McGovern Finance Committee December 31, 1972 report, furnished to the Government Accounting Office. As disclosed in this report, $25,000 was transferred from the Citizens for McGovern Presidential Campaign Committee to the Citizens for McGovern U.S. Senatorial Campaign Committee on November 20, 1972. By transfer of these funds and others, Senator McGovern has been able to supplement the resources of his Senatorial Citizens for McGovern Committee in the total amount of $340,416.96. Following is a list of McGovern presidential committees that transferred funds to Citizens for McGovern, U.S. Senate. Citizens for McGovern, Presidential, 1019 19th Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C. Date, November 20, 1972. Amount, $25,000. January 9, 1973, $25,000. February 14, 1973, $25,000. March 12, 1973, $100,000. May 17, 1973, $50,000. June 23, 
1973, $20,000. August 3rd, 1973, $10,000. August 10, 1973, $30,000. December 30, 1973, $7,054. The total, $292,000. And $54. McGovern for President, 721, Milwaukee, Box 3201, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Date, May 24, 1973. Amount, $1,000. Total, $1,000. Michigan McGovern for President Committee, 18647, Livernois Avenue, Detroit, Michigan. Date, August 20, 1973. Amount, $21,500. Total, $21,500. McGovern Committee, 6400G Goldsboro Road, number 301, Bethesda, Maryland. Date, September 29, 1973. Amount, $25,400. Total, $25,400. Almeida County Educators for McGovern. 2140 Shattuck Avenue, care of Ernest McCoy, Esquire, Berkeley, California. Date, December 19, 1973, $462.96. Total, $462.96. The grand total, $340,416.96. During this period, over the signature of Marion Perlman, McGovern National Treasurer, letters were sent to creditors to get them to agree to settle debts owed to them for less than the full amount. Thus, a letter dated December 15, 1972, by Miss Perlman to Miss Martha Keyes, 2339 Chris Drive, Manhattan, Kansas, reads, Henry is out of town, and I have your letter of December 3. First of all, the newspaper reports of the post-election financial condition of the McGovern for President Committee were inaccurate. We do not at this time have enough money to pay all our debts. I am hopeful that we will be able to obtain settlements from our creditors at less than the full amount owed. All state committees are expected to settle their financial affairs themselves. We are not assuming any state obligations. I would imagine that once you get all your accounts settled, the Topeka printer would be willing to settle for some payment on the account as payment in full. We are writing to our trade creditors asking them to settle for 50% of the amount owed. The committee investigation reveals that McGovern for President Incorporated, a presidential committee, has succeeded by way of payment at less than the full amount or no payment at all, in reducing obligations to business creditors, virtually all of them corporations, in the amount of $35,322.32. Initially, goods and services furnished by IBM for which payment was made at less than the full amount came to the attention of committee investigators, and IBM advised the committee by letter, dated February 14, 1974, that they had dealt with approximately 45 political committees during the presidential campaign of 1972 and had billed for goods and services provided in the amount of $952,000. Responding through their corporate counsel, IBM furnished information concerning the current status of their billing, which revealed that, as of February 14, 1974, they had current billings of $3,142.64. A delinquent billing of $6,979.13 and bills written off as uncollectible in the amount of $1,575.27. The $1,575.27 figure was for goods and services provided to McGovern for President Committees. The committee investigation also reveals that $9,606.02 was written off by Xerox as an uncollectible from the McGovern presidential campaign. A document furnished to committee investigators by Marianne Perlman entitled Schedule of Forgiven Debts in Excess of $100 listed 46 companies, not including IBM and Xerox, that were offered the opportunity to accept settlement for 50% of the amount owed, which was $36,000. 
$61.37. A check with these companies disclosed that 11 had eventually been paid in full. Following is a list of 37 companies which held indebtedness in excess of $100 for the McGovern presidential campaign of 1972 for a total of $35,322.32, which, according to committee investigation, was not paid. Schedule of forgiven debts in excess of $100. Creditor, IBM, Armonk, New York. Debt forgiven, $1,575.27. Xerox Corporation, Rochester, New York. $9,606.02. Stumart Press and Envelope Company, Post Office Box 85, Beltsville, Maryland, $135.60. Transion Air Freight, O'Hara International Airport, 5201 North Rose Street, Chicago, Illinois, $423.61. Wire Service Supply Company, 220 East 42nd Street, New York, New York. $117.04. Electronic Center, 5258 Reistertown Road, Baltimore, Maryland, $125. Winnipesaukee Aviation Incorporated, Post Office Box 165, Lakeport, New York, $399.50. Yankee Trails, 3rd Avenue Extension, Rensselaer, New York, $284. Airport Motor Inn, Post Office Box, 12422, Houston, Texas, $310.60. Audiovisual Innovations, Incorporated, 152 West 42nd Street, New York, New York, $326.83. Avis Grand Rent-A-Car, 1207 West 3rd Street, Los Angeles, California, $123.53. Radisson South, 7800, Normandale Boulevard, Minneapolis, Minnesota, $191.94. Bush Hill Transportation Company, 109 Norfolk Street, Dorchester, Maine, $192.70. Budget Rent-A-Car, 7195, South Bay Road, North Syracuse, New York, $150. Chateau Inn, Box 506, Chedris, Texas, $141.85. Cherry Hill Inn, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, $218.06. HF Rental, Leering Incorporated, Route 230, High Spire, Pennsylvania, $519.74. St. Anthony Hotel, P.O. Box 2411, Houston, Texas, $1,068.71. Sheraton, Ohio Motels, 210 North Main Street, Dayton, Ohio, $1,013.10. Patuxent Valley Bus Lines, 76 Industrial Lane, West Warwick, Rhode Island, $173.25. Color Film Corporation, P.O. Box 5003, Stamford, Connecticut, $268.60. East Shore Lines Charter Service, 55 Townsend Court, San Francisco, California. $297. Haynes and Company, 8050 Freedom Avenue, Northwest, North Canton, Ohio, $684.26. Hayes Motor Hotel, Jackson, Mississippi, $161.30. Holiday Inn of Houston, Nassau, 1300 Nassau Boulevard, Houston, Texas, $453.05. Holland and Tavern Incorporated, East 6th and Superior Avenue, Cleveland, Ohio, $128.71. Imperial Air Freight Service Incorporated, 151 Oliver Street, Newark, New Jersey, $411.27. Yellow Cab Company Incorporated, 816 I Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., $120. Welsh Catering Company, 1226 Folsom Street, San Francisco, California, $165.90. Airport Transit, 10053 International Road, Los Angeles, California, $142.50. Quadrangle Books, Incorporated, 
330 Madison Avenue, New York, New York, $307.17. Ramada Inn, 2151 South Hotel Circle, San Diego, California, $102.66. Robolith, 4535 Van Dam Street, Long Island City, New York, $4,173.32. Union Dining Service, Room 110, Union Building, Box 7036, University Station, Austin, Texas, $207.16. Uptowner Inn, Incorporated, 1415 Fourth Avenue, Huntington, West Virginia, $288.75. The total, $35,322.32. In a letter to Senator Irvin, Senator McGovern commented on the practice of his presidential campaign settling certain obligations at less than their face amount. First, when these debts were settled, there was every reason to believe that the McGovern campaign would not have enough money to cover all remaining obligations in full. At the beginning of January 1973, when the letter suggesting a settlement to creditors was sent out, the McGovern for President Committee had debts totaling some $800,000 and cash on hand of about $460,000. It was in part through settlements both of personal loans to the campaign and of these few bills owing to corporations that the deficit was worked down. By the end of February, we were down to roughly $100,000 in the red. Over time, with the payment of such bills owed to the campaign as press payments for air transportation, we ended up with a net surplus in terms of bills currently due. However, we were still obliged to hold reserves against such potential obligations as a workman's compensation suit in Oregon and a large tax claim. As recently as March 7, 1974, the treasurer of my campaign, Henry Kimmelman, advised me that our possible liabilities still exceeded our assets, even including in those assets earnings since the campaign from interest and rental of the mailing list. It may be argued that the feature distinguishing my campaign from other campaigns, which have settled debts to corporations at less than their full value, is the fact that pending disposition of remaining claims, there is at the moment a net balance remaining from my 1972 effort. But the fact is that at the time these settlements were made, we were confronted with a sizable deficit, which was eliminated only because a number of creditors were willing to extinguish our obligations in exchange for less than the total due. It is, of course, possible to look back from some 15 months later and conclude that we could have paid more of the obligations than were settled, and perhaps even to make a value judgment that in doing that we should have given a priority to corporate debts as opposed to individual loans and staff salaries and expenses which were in arrears because of a post facto conclusion that corporate settlements, although wholly at arm's length, are nonetheless akin to corporate contributions. But I suggest that charging us to foresee in January of 1971 how the books would ultimately balance out sets a requirement for superhuman foresight. Indeed, we cannot even foresee that for certain now. With liabilities greatly in excess of our firm assets, the only prudent thing to do at the time was to contact all creditors and suggest a settlement of the debts. That is precisely what we did. And as individual creditors responded, we made the agreed partial payments to extinguish the individual debt. With respect to the campaign's transferring certain funds to Senator McGovern's re-election campaign, he had the following comment. Funds were transferred from the Citizens for McGovern Committee, a presidential campaign committee, to my Senate campaign committee during the time when these debts were being settled. There is, of course, no prohibition against such transfers, even if it had been money raised at the national level. But in fact, these funds were not available for use in paying off debts incurred by the National McGovern campaign. Part of the funds transferred during the period when debts were being settled came from state and local McGovern committees, which had money remaining after the campaign. Those were funds raised on their own by autonomous committees working on behalf of my campaign. 
and the money was sent in to Washington after the election with the explicit understanding that it would be used in my 1974 campaign for re-election to the Senate. These groups had authority to dispose of their remaining funds in any way they saw fit, and they chose to support my South Dakota campaign. Application of their money to debts incurred by the national McGovern campaign, debts which were not the responsibility of those state and local groups, would have violated the choice they had every right to make in regard to the disposal of whatever balances they had on hand when the campaign was over. Like our national campaign committees, these various committees around the country were also reporting to the General Accounting Office. After consulting with legal counsel and with the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, we temporarily deposited these funds in the account of the Citizens for McGovern Presidential Committee to assure that the GAO records would show both ends of the transaction. This also had the advantage of simplifying our own bookkeeping operations. In addition, after the presidential campaign was over, we received a number of individual contributions from around the country for my Senate campaign. Those funds, too, were deposited temporarily in the Citizens for McGovern account. Section 10. Cash Contributions by Contractors Because of the withdrawal by presidential candidate John V. Lindsay, then mayor of New York City, prior to April 7, 1972, the Lindsay Campaign Committee did not file a federal report concerning their campaign finances. However, the receipt of cash contributions and the use of a safe deposit box after April 7, 1972, became the subject of a committee inquiry. Two $5,000 contributions in cash by officers of companies doing business with New York City are the focus of this discussion. In early 1972, David W. Kuyper, then Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Highways in the City of New York, solicited campaign contributions to assist the Lindsay campaign. Kuyper stated that, though not asked by anyone to solicit campaign contributions for candidate Lindsay, his actions were prompted by reading a newspaper article which related that Lindsay had sustained a $100,000 debt with the conclusion of the Florida primary. Prompted by this concern, Kuyper contacted Peter Jordan, a subordinate who was general supervisor of the New York City Highway Department, Queens Plant, located in Flushing, New York. Kuyper stated that he advised Jordan of the need for funds on the part of the Lindsay campaign and asked Jordan whether he might be able to be of some help. Kuyper stated that he believed that he and Jordan, in their conversation, mutually arrived at a plan to seek campaign contributions, but denied that there was any specific mention of soliciting contractors or suppliers of goods to the city of New York. This conversation took place at Kuyper's office. Kuyper stated that approximately a week after his initial conversation with Jordan, he met Jordan for lunch at a restaurant, and at that meeting, Jordan furnished to him an envelope containing $10,000 in $20 bills. Kuyper stated that Jordan did not tell him from whom the contributions were obtained, but indicated to him that the names of the contributors were included with the cash in the envelope. Kuyper advised the committee staff that he did not count the money to assure himself that, in fact, $10,000 was there, but only delivered the envelope to the Lindsay Lexington Avenue headquarters, where he personally handed it to Richard Aurelio, a former deputy mayor of New York City, and at that time, Lindsay's campaign manager. Kuyper stated that Aurelio accepted the contribution, glanced at the contents of the envelope, and then delivered the envelope to a third person and told him to count it and list it according to the names of the contributors. Kuyper stated that he had no conversation with candidate Lindsay with regard to this cash contribution and denied that he knew that the $10,000 contribution was obtained from two contractors who did business with the City of New York until a later time when he was questioned by a New York City investigator. On this occasion, he learned that $5,000 was contributed by Frank Licorti, owner of the Mascali Construction Corporation, and $5,000 by Frank Castiglione, a partner of the Jet Asphalt Corporation, with Lou and Fred Durante. On November 6, 1973, in a staff interview, Jordan confirmed that he had had a conversation with his former supervisor, Kuyper, 
relating to the financial needs of the Lindsay campaign. Kuiper had formerly exercised a supervision over the Queens Highway Department plant, which provided about one-third of the New York City asphalt production. Jordan generally affirmed the information furnished by Kuiper and related that in response to Kuiper's request for contributions to assist the Lindsay campaign. He did, in fact, contact Castiglione and Lou Durante, whose corporation is a substantial supplier of asphalt to the Queen's plant. Jordan mentioned to Castiglione and Durante his desire to obtain funds for the financially overextended Lindsay campaign, and though not being able to recall specifically, he stated that he may have mentioned an amount of money that he was seeking. On the same day, Jordan talked to Lacorti of the Mascali Corporation, which is located near the Jet Asphalt Corporation in Flushing, New York. About a week later, while on one of his daily visits to the Jet Asphalt Corp. and the Mascali Corp., he inquired of the owners what they were going to do concerning the contributions he had requested. Jordan stated that he received $5,000 contribution from Licorti and a $5,000 joint contribution from the co-owners of the Jet Asphalt Corporation. Jordan stated that, though the money was furnished to him in cash, he did not make a request for cash, and he had no recollection that in his discussions with Kuiper that cash contributions were mentioned. Subsequent to obtaining the contributions from the officers of these two corporations, Jordan met Kuiper at the Amber Lantern Restaurant in Flushing, New York, and handed Kuiper an envelope which contained the $10,000 in cash. Jordan stated Kuiper told him at that time, and later confirmed it, that he would take the money directly to Lindsay headquarters and give it to Aurelio. On November 5, 1973, in staff interview, Castaglione advised the committee that he had, in fact, furnished a $5,000 contribution, one-third of which was given by each partner of the Jet Asphalt Corporation. He related that the solicitation and contribution were consummated in late May or early June of 1972, and he confirmed that the solicitation was from Jordan, whom Castaglione knew to be active in politics. Castaglione stated that he understood that the money he was furnishing Jordan was for the Lindsay campaign. However, he denied that the contribution was in any way related to the awarding of contracts to his company by the City of New York. The committee uncovered evidence that the Jet Asphalt Corp. and the Mascali Corp. did, as a joint venture, make a bid and was awarded a contract in about July 1972 in the gross amount of $1,700,000 to provide asphalt to the City of New York for the period from July 1, 1972 to July 25, 1973. Castaglione denied that he saw anything wrong with the contribution he had furnished to Jordan, with the qualification added, quote, so long as the funds are personal and not corporate, unquote. Richard Aurelio, interviewed by the committee staff on October 17, 1973, stated that he was the senior official of the Lindsay campaign and functioned as campaign manager from December 1971 until early April 1972, when Lindsay withdrew from the race. Prior to December 1971, Aurelio had been deputy mayor of New York City and served in that capacity for two years. In response to inquiry concerning Aurelio's recollection of any cash contributions in excess of $1,000 received by the Lindsay campaign, Aurelio stated that he could recall only one situation which involved the receipt of two contributions in cash of $5,000 each. He explained that a short time after the Lindsay withdrawal, a New York City official delivered either one or two envelopes containing the two $5,000 contributions. He acknowledged that the money was contributed by two Queens contractors, but denied knowing either the names of the contractors or the city official who delivered these contributions. Aurelio acknowledged some awareness of a contribution to the Lindsay campaign from Mrs. John Loeb and a second contribution through Mrs. Loeb from Duane Andreas. However, he disavowed any knowledge that cash was furnished in these transactions. Aurelio stated that he was aware that the Lindsay campaign had a bank safe deposit box available for its use. However, he denied any knowledge of the location of the safe deposit box. 
He stated that Fergus Reed III was the senior financial officer with the Lindsay campaign and the individual who would have custody and control, as well as knowledge of those items maintained in the safe deposit box. Aurelio, when pressed for further details, advised that it was his belief that the cash contributed by the two Queen's contractors had been placed in a safety deposit box and that he had later learned of a disbursement from these funds for the payment of a polling bill. On September 21, 1973, Fergus Reed III advised the committee staff that he had served as the treasurer for Lindsay's 1972 presidential campaign from December 1, 1971, until Lindsay withdrew after the Wisconsin primary. Reed described his responsibilities as receiving, maintaining, dispersing, and accounting for Lindsay's funds. He stated that he did not have any responsibility for fundraising, that is, the actual solicitation, but he was on several occasions the recipient of contributions to the campaign. Reed identified Steve McDonald as the finance director for the Lindsay campaign who had responsibility for fundraising efforts. Reed furnished to the committee the names of the Lindsay campaign committees in whose names checking accounts were maintained at the Chemical Bank of New York City. He identified these committees, the Elect John Lindsay Committee, the Lindsay in 1972 Committee, and the Aurelio Testimonial Committee. In addition, Reed confirmed that the Lindsay campaign did have a safe deposit box, which, though at the time of this interview, Reed believed to be at the chemical bank. He later provided information that the safe deposit box was located in the First National City Bank at 111 Wall Street, New York City. In response to questions concerning cash contributions to the Lindsay campaign, Reed advised the committee staff that he could personally recall three persons who contributed sums in cash. One was John Loeb, and the other two were building contractors in Queens, the last two having contributed $5,000 each. Reed denied any knowledge of the circumstances surrounding the contributions furnished by the Queens contractors and specifically stated that he had no knowledge with regard to the reasons for which the contractors made these contributions in cash. In a subsequent interview on October 2, 1973, Reed advised the committee staff that he had determined that the safe deposit box served to provide a ready source of cash disbursement to advance men and petty cash reimbursements to campaign workers. Though conceding that he had access to the safe deposit box along with Steve McDonald, the Lindsay finance director, Reed denied that he had ever used the box and stated that, to the best of his recollection, the most cash ever in the box was approximately $15,000. Steve McDonald, finance director for Lindsay's principal campaign committee, Lindsay in 72, began his duties in December 1971 and concluded his full-time paid employment on April 10, 1972. McDonald told the committee staff on September 24, 1973, that he did not know of any solicitation activity to obtain political contributions in cash and further stated that he had no knowledge that others connected with the Lindsay campaign solicited cash. He stated that he had knowledge of some cash contributions in excess of $1,000 and noted that he personally received a $10,000 cash contribution from Mrs. John Loeb, which he obtained from a secretary in John Loeb's office. He stated that he had no recollection of discussing this particular contribution with Lindsay and could offer no explanation as to why this contribution was in the form of cash. McDonald stated that he delivered this cash contribution to Reed's office, where, to the best of his recollection, he gave the money to Mrs. Elaine Wallenstein. McDonald stated that he believes the $10,000 cash contribution was put in a safe deposit box but he claims no knowledge as to the use made of these funds. McDonald related that at a subsequent time, possibly before the Florida primary, Mrs. Loeb gave to him an additional $5,000 in cash contribution, which she told him was from Duane O. Andreas. Again, McDonald transmitted this cash contribution to Reed's office. McDonald recalled that there was another cash contribution received by the Lindsay Committee and that contribution was from a New York architect. McDonald denied knowledge of any cash contributions coming from contractors 
doing business with the City of New York and further stated that he had no knowledge of the use of cash to pay for any goods and services in excess of $500. Mrs. Elaine Wallenstein was interviewed by the committee staff on October 26, 1973. She advised that she handled the bookkeeping duties which included the recording and the deposit of contributions received by the Lindsay campaign. She noted that the Lindsay campaign treasurer's office was located at 110 Wall Street. Mrs. Wallenstein advised the committee that, at the direction of her supervisor, Reed, she had leased a safe deposit box from the First National City Bank of New York City in late December of 1971 or early January of 1972. She noted that the signatories for the box were, in addition to herself, Reed and McDonald, and that, for the sake of convenience, the box had been leased in her name rather than in the name of the Lindsay campaign. At the time the bank deposit box was opened, Mrs. Wallenstein stated that she recalled a conversation with Reed during which she believed he told her that Aurelio had requested that a safe deposit box be opened. She stated that in January of 1972, at about the same time the bank safe deposit box was opened, she received a sealed envelope from the Lindsay Madison Avenue headquarters and was instructed to put the envelope in the safe deposit box, which she did. She stated that she cannot recall any marking on the envelope, nor can she explain her belief that the envelope contained an unknown amount of cash. She recalled that approximately a week later, she was instructed to take the envelope out of the box and have it delivered to the Madison Avenue headquarters. She kept no record of the receipt or return of the envelope to the Lindsay headquarters and stated that she has no knowledge of what was done with the package after delivery. Mrs. Wallenstein stated that in July 1972, she received a phone call from Reed asking that she pick up a package for him at Aurelio's home. She stated that she followed these instructions and obtained from Aurelio an envelope which she later opened. She stated that the envelope contained $20,000 in cash, but she has no recollection as to the denomination of the bills. She placed this money in the safe deposit box and informed Reed of her actions on this matter. He then instructed her to bring all or part of the cash, she cannot remember, in the envelope to the finance office. Upon receiving these instructions, she took the envelope out of the box and delivered it to Mrs. Emily Aurelio. She recalled that Reed had told her that some bills would be paid with these monies. Mrs. Wallenstein advised the staff that the only other occasion she could recall using the bank box was in late April 1972, and at that time, McDonald had delivered to her an unsealed envelope which contained cash. She stated that she did not count the money, and on the following day, upon receiving instructions from Reed, she removed the envelope and delivered it to the Lindsay headquarters, though she stated she did not know to whom she was delivering these various amounts of cash it was her belief that these monies were going to Aurelio. In addition, Mrs. Wallenstein stated that no records of receipt or deposit to the safe deposit box relating to the contents were ever made. Mrs. Wallenstein advised that she had no knowledge that cash contributions had been received from John Loeb, Duane Andreas, Frank Castiglione, or anyone else. She related that any such cash contributions could represent the deposits she made to the safe deposit box, but she said that this was speculation on her part. Mrs. Emily Aurelia advised the committee that she worked in the capacity of clerk typist from January 1972 to October 1972 for the Lindsay campaign. She stated that she could only remember three instances wherein she handled cash contributions in excess of $1,000 and recalled that on one occasion in January 1972, she picked up $2,400 at the Madison Avenue headquarters and deposited this money in the campaign account, Aurelio Testimonial Account. This account was located in the Chemical Bank of New York. She noted that, so far as she knew, this cash represented the sale of dinner tickets. Mrs. Aurelia recalled that in July or August of 1972, at the request of Mrs. Wallenstein, she typed two receipts in the total amount of $7,800 to do business concerns. 
In the second case, when she counted the cash in the presence of Mrs. Wallenstein, they found that they were $100 short. So she accompanied Mrs. Wallenstein across the street to the First National City Bank, where she withdrew additional funds from the safe deposit box. Mrs. Aurelia stated that this was her first knowledge of the existence of a safe deposit box and the only time she had occasion to go to the box. End of section 14. Recording by John Dennison, Portland, Maine.